In the shamanic tradition, ancestors, it's very always important to um, honor the ancestors. For one thing, the ancestors gave us life, and in shamanism, life is so precious. So being grateful to the ancestors for the life that they've given, also the teachings that are passed down from generation to generation. And I don't know any shamans who would not start a ceremony with honoring the ancestors. It would be seen as extremely uh, disrespectful. And it's also believed that there are ancestors in what in shamanism we call the middle world, which is this world here. So before I came here this morning, I asked permission of the ancestors of this land if it's okay for me to come and be here and talk in this group. And um, I, I teach for a, a foundation called the Foundation for Shamanic Studies here. And years ago, um, the foundation brought a Uchi shaman from Siberia who was in his 90s to Westerbeck Ranch here in Sonoma. And uh, Grandfather Duvan, he, he started studying shamanism when he was 17 and he was in his 90s when um, I met him. So, you know, he had quite a presence. And he spent days introducing himself to every tree. And, um, <laughs> and before every ceremony, he said in Uchi, we, we had translators, so we knew what he was saying in the ceremonies. But as he started every ceremony, he apologized to the ancestors of the land that he did not know their ways. And please not punish him for working in a different way that the California Indians did because he was coming from a different land. He would say to the spirits, we heard this from the translator, he would say, they're making me do this. <laughs> Please don't punish me. But, um, you know, to, to honor, you know, the ancestors, they lived here. They loved the land. And so here, you know, now in this time of travel, you have people from shamanic traditions traveling all over the place, coming to do ceremonies on land where for, you know, hundreds of years these ancestors have been doing these ceremonies. So to walk in from um, an innocent place that, that they're not here, still protecting the land and working spiritually um, is, a, is a real lack of respect. And I, I found a really long time ago in workshops, if I was finding a lot of obstacles, like weather to the point where it was becoming dangerous for people to be on the land, um, things that were becoming really big obstructions, if I would just stop the work and honor the ancestors and ask the ancestors for help, all the obstacles would disappear. So, you know, with some, the thing about shamanism is shamanism is a system of direct revelation. So when Llewellyn said, I don't like to answer questions, it's because from a shamanic tradition, you get your own answers. You don't ask somebody else for an, an answer. And so I didn't really have anybody teach me about how important it was to honor the ancestors where I was working. I found from experience and just bringing groups to different places that things went a lot better if I spoke to the ancestors and talked mm -hmm. to them first. So there's just a real tradition of honoring the people who have lived on the land for a certain period of time and that we're all working in partnership together and to bring them in, invite them into the circle. Mm -hmm. Um, it's important in all shamanic cultures. I can't think of any shamanic cultures that would not start off anything without honoring the ancestors first. Yeah. Because human beings are so beautiful. If, if, you, mm -hmm. if you were allowed one moment, I was given this experience when I was 22 of seeing what human beings are really like. And they are so beautiful. They are so full of light. I always say it is the great mystery is, is, is not that we are full of light, but that we are not allowed to experience it very much. Mm -hmm. If you all knew what you were really like, you know, 90% of your problems would dissolve and you'd think, why am I wasting my time with this worry, with that anxiety, with that problem? Because human beings are incredibly beautiful.
And when a human being turns towards the spirit, towards God, that light becomes magnified. They are really unbelievably beautiful. And then when the light of different human beings works together for the sake of the whole, which is part of the work we are trying to do here, then it is a whole other dimension of light upon light. It is very, very beautiful. It is really something starts to sing, something. There is like an ancient remembrance, which for me belongs to the ancient remembrance of the world, when in a way this was the most natural way to live. When this the light of the human being, the spiritual part of the human being was a natural part of life, when everything was sacred, when everything you did included that dimension. And then it is like to remember what it was when life was like that, when there was this, I think you spoke about joy, when there was this pure note of joy that ran through life. Yeah, then. Yeah, well, so walking in this room and, you know, coming from one tradition and meeting with another tradition. We are all one. Certainly, but I, you know, I felt, I felt challenged here today. Challenged? Uh, Why? Ch challenged, because I feel that there is a need to come with a certain attitude of focusing on that light that we're sharing. But you are that light. Mm -hmm. Of course. How can you focus on what you are? You are. It's to forget everything else, to leave it all. Like, like when you leave your shoes at the door of the temple. You just leave it. It really has to do, again, with your perception as you walk into a room. What, when I was in my um, early 20s, I had a near-death experience. And I went to who I call God. It was this great light, and I stood in front of God. And I realized... <coughs> at that moment, it was, it was really a powerful experience for me. Hitler was standing next to me in front of God. And God loved us exactly the same. There was no difference between the two of us. Love is love. And it, it was such a transformative experience for me to realize that in the universe, there is no recognition of anything except light and love. And that's all that's recognized. And so, it, you know, I, my husband and I have, you know, we always kind of walk into rooms and he'll say something like, God, isn't the energy great in this room? And I'll feel like, God, isn't the energy terrible in this room? I mean, it all has to do with your perception, you know? And it's what you, it's what you experience and what you want to experience. But, but the bottom line is there is only light and love. It's what you end up choosing to experience. So for me, it's about setting an intention to always see that light in other people. And that intention, once again, creates action. Thank you. I've been reading your book, Llewellyn, about um, spiritual power. And right. you speak about the web of light. Mm -hmm. And then you speak about how that is, um, it's an energetic, as, as I understand it, web of light, and that it needs to be anchored. Yeah, through and, us. Pardon? Through us, yeah. Through us. And that is where my question is, how do we do it? By connecting consciously to the oneness of life. You see, I give a little bit of background. In order to make any step in spiritual evolution, you, you, you can sit down if you like, because you can't film me from behind, and now we're into this. Um, <laughs> in, sorry, in order to make any step in spiritual evolution, there has to be a container. And in our tradition, that's one of the reasons you do spiritual practices, is actually you create an inner container. And in, in many traditions, this container is a body of light that you create so you can then inhabit this body of light and then begin to have experiences in, in the realm of light. As I always say the best little book for that is The Secret of the Golden Flower, translated by Wilhelm. It's a Taoist classic. So there has to be a container that is created, but it's only a container. What actually happens is, of course, what you do with this container, like any container. Now, 
there has been this container created for this next level of evolution, this transformation of consciousness, whether you call it global <coughs> consciousness, consciousness of oneness, which you can see is already here just by the fact the internet, global communication, um, the fact that we know what's happening in all parts of the world. You can see there is this global consciousness, but it, it isn't really fully awake yet. And this is like a consciousness of oneness. It's the next step of evolution of human consciousness. Because all evolution is the evolution of human consciousness for, for, for human beings. I don't know about the, the plant world or the animal world or the spirit world, but for human beings, evolution means the evolution of consciousness. Because I don't know if you're aware that human beings, we are carriers of divine consciousness. That's when a human being existed separate from the animal kingdom was when they were given this spark of divine consciousness. And then over the thousands of years, human beings evolved working with this consciousness. And in, in the West, in the last era, there has been this era of separation in which we've realized our individuality. This spark of divine consciousness has made us aware we are separate from each other, we are unique, we are individual. And then the next step is to take that spark of divine consciousness of our individual self and give it back to the whole. Just like in the spiritual path, you develop your light so you can give it back to God, so you can be in service to God. Now, the needs, as I said, there needs to be a container for this. You can't just suddenly wake up and everybody's on the plane of divine oneness. Um, it's just... So the container that has been created in this around the world is this web of light, which has been created, I use the expression, the masters of love, those who know how to work with the light of humanity. And so this work has been done. It's almost complete. I've seen it grow in the last 20 years or so. This container for the next step of evolution. But one of the, the sort of little key things is that Although these great beings, these masters, can do this work, it is up for, to humanity to live it. Because we carry the divine consciousness in this world. And the, the web of light is in the inner worlds, in the spiritual worlds. You can see it there. It's very, very beautiful. It's, like, it's called, in the East, it's, uh, something similar was called Indra's web, which is this beautiful. It's more to do with the web of life. Now, here in this plane, we've become aware of what we call the web of life this interconnected oneness, which includes all of creation, whether it's ecological oneness, this beautiful web of life. But the web of life isn't doing so well at the moment, yeah? Because people are manipulating it, and some people are starving when there's enough food to go around, and they're burning the rainforests, and all of that. So there needs to be this connection between the web of light in the higher worlds and the web of life in this world. And the human being is the connection. And that's the little practice I gave you this morning in which you consciously recognize you are this divine being who is part of the oneness of creation. And, you know, it is interesting because we have been so addicted by this masculine idea of doing. We've got to do something. We've got to save the world. Consciousness itself is very, very, very powerful. We, if you look at most spiritual traditions, they, they teach you that. As, as Sandra was saying, it is your conscious attitude that creates the world you live in. And consciousness itself is very, very powerful because it's, it's divine. Your real consciousness is this divine spark. And if you consciously connect yourself, say, I am part of the whole of life. I I am aware that I am part of the whole life. There are simple practices you can do for that. You can just, as a simple imaginative practice, in the end it stops being just imagination, because it is. You just become aware you are connected to everything. You don't want to do it all the time, because you know, then certain practical things become difficult. But you just become consciously aware, like we could do it here in this room for a moment. You just, you're part of the whole of life, consciously. It's such a relief, you know to be part of the whole of life, because it is so exhausting being this separate individual, which, as Sandra was giving this 
image of this finger trying to hang around on its own is, you know, is not very pleasant. Um, you know, the moment you say you're part of the whole life, something and you can relax, you can let go. Oh, so, you know, I'm part of it all. And then a lot of, you know how much of our anxieties and worries are created because of this insular consciousness that we've been conditioned to believe? I mean, particularly in North America, you're, there is this conscious condition, you've got to do it on your own. I mean, and, and for some reason in the Puritan con conditioning, you're not even allowed grace. You've even got to get a God on your own, you know? And you've got to work really hard at it. And, you know, first of all, you can't do anything on your own. You, because we're not a separate living organism. We're not a single cell floating in space. We're part of this extraordinarily beautiful, creative dance organism, this wholeness that's creating itself and recreating itself. And we have a brief moment of experience here, and then we're going to have a slightly longer experience in the inner worlds after we die, and then we're going to be back again, and we're going to do another little twirl on this planet, and we're going to be off somewhere else. And, you know, it's continually moving, continually changing, and that's where we are, and we can either experience that, or we can live this slightly paranoid life as being this individual person living in this box, trying really hard to make ends meet. Um, and I know which I'd rather be doing. And so you just have to say, yeah, I'm here. I'm part of it. Show me what to do. Show me how to join in. And then, believe it or not, you know, the other cells in the body tell the finger what to do. I mean, you don't have to think to move your finger, it just kind of moves because there's this, we're part of this organic wholeness called life. And then life will put you where you need to be. And if you need to suffer, so you're going to suffer. You know, you try and run away from it to get somewhere else, you're going to suffer over there. And if you need to be happy at this time, you're going to be happy. And you'll do what you need to do, and it might be mundane, and it might be exciting, and it doesn't matter because you're part of life. And one blade of grass isn't better than another blade of grass. And a, you know, a rose does what a rose does, and a tulip does what a tulip does, and it's all one, and you're all part of it. And it's, nobody's better and nobody's worse. And it's, it's such a relief. And all you have to do is say, yes. It's a little thing. And there, there are so many different levels that you, could, you can work on. I know that Gandhi worked on all levels. I can't. It really makes me sick. It really makes me ill. Um, so I had to find that place where I know I'm doing something good for the planet and I'm thriving at the same time. So we, we all have to, we're all pieces of the puzzle. There's so many different pieces of the puzzle and it's about all of it. It's not an either or an or, it's about all of it. of those things I don't have to worry about, which means I can use what the freedom that I have been given to do this other work. And if you like, that's the contribution I feel that I can make. Like Sandra, I couldn't go off and, you know, and, and battle in the outer world because it's not my nature. But there is, it does seem, and I'm completely committed to this, a need to consciously go to this source of life and, and welcome it back into the world and allow oneself to be used. This is changing the, the dream. Allow one's consciousness to be used to, to create images and forms that are healing, that are beneficial, that can allow the next generation to have a life that is sacred, that is whole again. And that is just my contribution. Other people make other contributions. Like she says, people go and they, they fight the outer wars and God bless them. But I am drawn into this dream that is being born. And I think that I am part of my work and part of the, the work of actually making the gathering like this and um, ones we're going to continue having, making them available not just to a small select audience in Marin, but by putting them on the internet so they are freely available to anybody, is to, to hopefully wake up that 
need that consciousness in, in other people who are also drawn to it but maybe don't value it so much because it's, it's, it's kind of so simple and so ordinary. Just to give five minutes of one's day of pure awareness for the sake of life. Not my life, not the life of my friends, but life. Just to, in one's meditation to include the world. To, to go to this place that is the most sacred place in creation, which is where you can see it. Actually, it's very beautiful. She, Sandra was saying about love. There is this beautiful place in the inner worlds where love comes. And you can see it and, it, and it comes out of the emptiness, and love comes. And then it, love at the beginning is completely formless. And then it takes on the light of creation. At the beginning, it is a very, very pure light. It is almost invisible. It is so pure. And then this extraordinary mystery happens as if it like comes through a prison. And out of that single pure light, the colors of creation manifest. And we, because it is at this moment of, of transition, we are allowed, and this is so sacred, to create the forms of the future. In the middle of an era, they have been created. You work with them, yes. You create beautiful cathedrals out of them. You make beautiful music out of them, whatever. But the forms of the future have not yet been created. And all of us here who have an awareness are allowed to go there and to start. These are the very, a certain groundwork has been done. And now this energy can begin to take on forms and forms that belong to our sacred connection to life and to the divine within ourselves. And to me that is very, very important work to do. And it is out of that, out of few groups of people around the world that the next era will come into being. Or not. Or not. Engaging the world. Yeah, engaging this world as it is. Well, um, you see that in the okay. external way, as opposed okay. to I in mean, the may, internal way. Maybe I can just take what you said that engaging in this world as it really is. Now, I didn't I, say as it really is. As it is. I want to debate with you. What I have discovered is you cannot do this work seriously unless you engage in this world as it is. For example, this work cannot be done unless you are living in the moment. But why? Because it is not. It is working with the source of life. And the source of life is only present in the present moment. It isn't present tomorrow or yesterday. It is only present now. It is also only present where you are. This is, I always <coughs> like to quote Meister Eckhart, who said, God is a, a circle whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. And I think life is also the, the divine life, the real life not the, the fantasy life. The real life is also a circle whose center is everywhere. And you can only live it where you are. And to me, the beauty of oneness is where you are is where you need to be. The moment you think, well, maybe I could do it better somewhere else, or if I did this, I would be more involved, you've lost it. Because it is where you are at that moment. And that's one of the reasons and I was so moved when Sandra, in her practice, included the <coughs> breath. Because again, you can only breathe where you are. And that's one of the reasons that conscious breathing is, is central to so much spiritual practice. You breathe, you are there. And if you live where you are consciously in relationship to the whole of life, then you are contributing. And it can be, it doesn't matter if you're drawn into politics, God bless you. Um, you're a better person than me. Um, if, if, if you are, wherever you are drawn, wherever your attention is taking, because please remember, life is a living organism. And I, as a living organism, it will direct your attention where it needs you to be. It's as simple as that. Because we have created this myth of separation, we think we have to decide what to do with our life. I would have no idea what to do with my life. Well, I would if I could decide. I'd find a nice little hut somewhere and I'd get a bowl of rice a day and I would be in meditation because that's really what I enjoy doing. I happen to like chocolates and cheese occasionally, but um, <laughs> you know, a Swiss, a little hut, hut in Switzerland is very nice. You know. <laughs> life takes you where you need to be. This is, I suppose, this is Taoism. You go with the Tao. You go with the spiritual energy of life. And it's great because you don't, have to decide. You know, 
Sandra and me didn't decide to do this gathering together. It kind of mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, we happened to meet, uh, and it just happened. And, and to me, that is life. That is spiritual life. Life, that is where you need to be. Your attention is taken where you need to be. That's why I said to her, it's, it's so strange, because after meeting you a year ago, my work has taken on this whole shamanic dimension. And whether that came from her or whether... Who knows? It just was. And if you really, if you say that life in its essence is divine, you can trust God, you can trust life. God takes your attention where he wants it to be or she wants it to be. Life takes your attention where it wants you to be. And then there is no problem. You don't have to decide anything. You are where you need to be. And, you know, what the, what the Taoists say, and I'm really an old Taoist, is you just wait and life shows you you let the you have the patience to wait till the water the ripples in the water fade away and then you see clearly it's so simple because life is simple and life is one and we are the oneness of life we're not even actually we say we are part of the oneness of life we are not actually part of the oneness of life we are the oneness of life we are each a divine Oneness of life. It's very beautiful. It's what real being a human being is really about. And if you live it, then you're here, you're alive. Yesterday's dream, tomorrow's dream, it doesn't matter. And um, I have a question, please, about um, the children and um, relating with the young people and the young people coming in. Now, you said something about the DNA change. And uh, this is a question for both of you, actually. Um, how do we talk to them so that we interface? Those of us with more life experience, we know it hasn't always been like this, and we know it always won't be like this. It's not sustainable. So how do we interface with the young people now so that they have a sense of... Um, some of the nuts and bolts of what's going on. And they also have a sense of, uh, and when I say nuts and bolts, I mean um, the inequality. And also, that how do we um, impart a sense of possibility and um, honoring? Thank you. I, I've um, written I've been in process of writing a lot about working with children. And in my workshops, so many participants have grandchildren and, and children and, of course, want to know how to work with children. Um, it's, a, it's a very big issue, but the, some of the things that I can share here are I think the, the sooner that you can start um, encouraging children like, I, I've been writing a book with a child psychotherapist, and people say, when do you teach children about shamanism and shamanic journeying? And she says, as soon as they can talk, you know, as soon as they can talk. So the younger that you can get children, and it's more than talking to them, it's listening to them. And listening to what they have to say and validating, not saying stop talking to that imaginary friend or stop dreaming. Um, they, they are our future. We're not the future at the moment. And they're coming in with their own solutions. And so for me, it's about listening to them because they already have the knowledge, but we squash the knowledge and say, you have to listen to me. I have more experience than you. But, you know, they came in with this brilliance of all the information of how to dream the new dream and the new vision. So I think as soon as you can get a child and the more you can listen and encourage them and encourage their creativity, I, I think that's the biggest gift that we can give to children. And, of course, where I get stuck because I've tried to bring spiritual practice into um, 
uh, that 13 year old range where you know they're listening to their iPods while I'm trying to give them instructions <laughs> of how to journey and talking on the cell phone. Yeah, that's listen. right. <laughs> We're going to do that with these meetings. <laughs> That, that's challenging. That's definitely challenging. Those situations are where I've closed my eyes and drummed, and I didn't want to see what was happening in the room, you know. But but there is that real ripe age, and we can really um, we can encourage children. They 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 came into this time knowing the challenges they were going to face. That is their destiny. That's their destiny to come in and bring us to. That, that next state. So to encourage them and encourage their strength and let them grow into their power, I think is, is really the great gift that we can um, give to children. You said something about uh, us creating or building the images for the future. Mm -hmm. And my question was, I guess the place where I come from uh, is, uh, sitting in my room by myself creating, you know, an image for the future by myself. But I, I think what you're talking about maybe is something uh, more inclusive of more um, of, of groups of people together coming to an image for the future, something like that. I don't really understand. Okay, first of all, it's an important question because it's a very practical question. First of all, there is, there is no such thing as sitting by oneself. It does not exist. I always remember years ago, Mrs. Tweedy gave us this practice in which she told us to take an orange and to peel it, and to peel it, you know, take an orange and when we were completely on our own, to peel it, and to describe the experience that we had. And so people came back from into the meditation group and, and they described you know, these experiences. They peeled the orange and they saw the segments of the orange as the different aspects of the whole. Or there was this sweet aroma that from the orange that reminded them of God. Or you'd be surprised, this was, you know. <laughs> 20 years ago, we all had wonderful experiences of peeling this orange. And at the end of, you know, 20 minutes, she just said, none of you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and later I read, the, I came across it in a classic Sufi text, actually. It is a particular Sufi teaching. It said, you are never alone. You cannot peel an orange on your own because you are never alone. And the moment you realize that you step out of this image, this dream, this fantasy of your own separate self. And you can either, there are two ways you can do it. You can either step out of it through direct experience, mystical experience of the divine or one, oneness, which many people have. Or you can also use the imagination to step out into this other reality or this re reality that is much more present, which is we are all connected. And that's one of the reasons I like the, the, the internet, because it's actually a symbol, a living symbol that's been given to humanity to express this interconnected oneness. And the moment you realize you're not alone, you are a, an organic center of light that belongs to this organic light structure. And so if your consciousness is being used to create an image, your consciousness that is creating this image is directly connected to the conscious, it is the consciousness of the whole. And you don't know how your consciousness is being used. This is the beauty of it. You don't know how what you are doing in your room, this awareness that you have, you don't know how this interconnects with the oneness of life. You don't know what is being resonated around this whole web of life that's also a web of light. And it works completely differently to our logical, rational mind. Why? Because it is alive and it belongs to God. And it is very, very, very beautiful. And it needs our consciousness to bring something alive. And it needs our individual consciousness. Yes, it can function in a group like this. It can't it cannot function in, in an organization. It cannot function in a hierarchy. If you have any hierarchical organization, it's dead. That belongs to the dream of the past. The life energy is already being withdrawn from them. They function dysfunctionally. You can say that. <laughs> <laughs> 
organic structures that move, that change, that are not fixed, that is where life is recreating itself. And we are part of it. And as I said, you don't have to go off and do anything. You just have to, if you're a person that's drawn to, to groups, then you, you will participate in groups. If you're a person who's drawn to being alone, it will be alone. What's most important is you hold the image and you recognize its sacred dimension. Because it is the sacred, your conscious awareness of the sacred dimension of an image that gives you access to its power. What Jung called its numinosity. The sacred dimension of the imaginal archetypal world. And once you recognize its sacredness, then it is like a key that can unlock the living energetic potential in that image. Jung said clearly, he said, it is the archetypal images that decide the fate of man. He said, it's not consciousness. It's not what happens in the conscious self. It is the archetypal images. They are incredibly powerful. He called them the riverbeds of life through which the energy of life flows. And <coughs> they, if they are held in the consciousness of human beings who are attuned to their own divine potential, then they bring that divine energy into life to recreate life once again in a direct relationship between the divine and life. And it doesn't matter where you are because you are life. You are not yourself. This is, a, this is really a, another myth. You, you, you are life. This spark of life that has been given this individual identity for a few years to have experiences on this plane. Yes, but you are, each of us here is a spark of life <coughs> that is just part of life. And it can create images. And it can be used to create the images of the future or drown in the images of the past. And, and also one thing is, please do not take this too seriously. <laughs> you know, that this is part of the Puritan spiritual conditioning. <laughs> Nobody is allowed to have spiritual fun. <laughs> I, one thing I can tell you about this work of oneness, this work of the future, it has to be fun. So Llewellyn, this is the second time I've heard you talk about this work with women and, and something in me deeply understands that. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to provide some instruction or direction how to um, begin to, to deepen into that process. Deepen what? The, the work that you're describing for women to do. The work I'm describing for women to do. Oh, that work to do with the with the spiritual body of the world. Mm. That is very, very important. Mm. What comes to me is first women need to reattune themselves with the sacred rhythm of life which is something we have forgotten. Because there is a certain work that can only be done in this world when you are attuned to that rhythm. You can work in the inner planes, out of the body. It doesn't matter, but if you are, want to work in this world, first of all, you have to... It is like the breath of life. Your breath has to be the breath of life. You just go... You breathe with the world. You align yourself with the sacredness of matter and and so in a way you become one body and then when you are in tune with the rhythm of life which is your rhythm then something there is this opening between you and life there is this you see feminine mysteries held the secrets of creation for thousands and thousands of years. And this was the work of the priestesses in the temples. They held this for humanity and they, this sacred understanding of, of the relationship between spirit and matter. And when we, the patriarchy came and it cut, cut, killed the priestesses and cut that sacred understanding. So, it is for each woman first to respect that part of herself 
and that rhythm within her, which is also, um, I wonder if it has to do with what you talk about, the moon rhythm in mm -hmm. reading some of your books, is the moon rhythm, which is the cycle of life and this deep connection that a woman has that a man doesn't with the, it's in the blood, with this deep understanding of life. And so you first have to familiarize yourself with that until it is completely like the breath, like the awareness. So your breath and the breath of the world are in harmony. And then, then something can be given through you into the world that can start its healing process. It can be given through your... Because there is always a part of the human being that never fully incarnates. For example, one of the things in, in our practice when we do the breath, we're, we're told to be aware of the breath, and particularly the, the space between the in-breath and the out-breath. And if you watch your breath, there is this moment at the end of the in-breath, which is a moment of bliss. Every, every, at the end of every in-breath, there is a moment of bliss, which is the moment the soul goes back to its own plane. Which is why, for example, they say that the last breath of a dying person is always an in-breath. Oh! The last gasp, the soul goes back to its own plane and it doesn't come back. So there is always part of the soul that never fully incarnates in this plane. And if there is a beautiful image of this, actually, it's in Jung's Memories, Dreams, Reflections, when he had this dream experience and he was walking down this little road in Switzerland and he came upon this roadside shrine and he went in there and in this little roadside shrine there was no cross, there was nothing but there he saw this yogi in deep meditation and he looked at the face of the yogi and he saw the yogi's face was his face and he was aware that if that yogi came out of meditation he, Jung, would die and that is the part of the spiritual being of everybody that remains outside this world. And this is traditionally, in most people's near-death experiences, this is actually the light they meet at the end of the tunnel. They say it's God because that is their nearest experience of God. It's not God. If you met God, there would be no tunnel, there would be nothing. God is so tremendous, so vast, so incomparable, beyond even our idea of the beyond. But that light is the light of your own divine essence, which is, for most people, their experience of God. That incredibly bright light that's there waiting for them. Most people reconnect with that after they die. In, in mystical practice, you die before you die, so you reconnect with that, you live that while in this body. But it's, it never completely incarnates. And in that spiritual self, there is a certain energy that can help the evolution of the world. If you are, it, it is in a way, it has to do with the, the divine intention of creation. And when a human being is aligned with that and present in life, it can come through your spiritual body, so it remains outside of, outside of the cycle of creation. So, and this is very, very important because it means it cannot be contaminated. Everything, the moment it hits the planes of creation, it is caught in the, in the play of light and dark that belongs to creation. Even in the archetypal world, there are, it isn't good and bad there, but there are shadows. There are, <coughs> but this the, stays on the plane of the self. It is completely uncontaminated. It has to do with the, the real purity of the human being. And that light can be given through your spiritual centers directly into the spiritual energy structure of this planet. And it, is, it has in it both divine intention but also the, the purpose. It, it's like Sandra was saying, there is awareness but there is intention. And intention is a certain energy to make something happen. And the first thing it has to do is to clear certain blocks 
that exist in the energy field of the, of the world before something can happen. Just as the same way as in an individual transformation, you have to do a certain purification before a certain energy can flow through you. And then that's the first thing it can do. And it, and it, and it is, remember, it has divine intention and it is not contaminated. It is very, very pure. It is like, like quicksilver. It is like this alchemical thing. And it can go... I always say it can go to places that other energy cannot go because it belongs, it has this direct connection between the creator and the creation that is uncontaminated by the play of good and bad and free will and everything like that. And the first thing it do, there are certain places in the energy structure of the world that have become locked. And it can go there and it can it can take away, it can absorb certain impurities. And that is a work that's beginning to happen now. And then the, then the next stage is for the energy to actually begin to... There are certain switches in the... They exist in the, in the spiritual structure of a human being, and they also exist in the spiritual structure of the world. And... For example, one of the reasons traditionally you, uh, there comes a point when you need a spiritual master is you need somebody to turn those switches on inside of you that give you access to different frequencies of energy. And it, it's called, I suppose they call it now, wait, you know, opening the chakras. That was one of the Indian things. It's, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that because you do not want them opened or awakened before you're ready because you get flooded then with an energy you cannot contain. But there, just like there are in a human being, there, is, there are certain energy centers and you can, if you know how to do it, you, you fl it's a bit like flicking a switch and then you give them access to a whole different energy they have latent within them. And it's exactly the same in the energy field of the world. That is why the world is not going to evolve linearly because a human being does not evolve linearly and we are the microcosm of the whole. A human being is, this person said, you, you wake up, says Satoru, you, you wake up and it's a whole different level of consciousness is given to you because something flicked a switch. At a particular time in your evolution, a switch was flicked. And those exist and there's one here in Northern California very, it's, it's actually quite a big switch. <laughs> and, and it's actually why, one of the reasons that so many spiritual groups gravitated towards here, because they are waiting to participate in a certain spiritual awakening. And, but it has to be right, there has to be a certain balance, there has to be a certain harmony, there has to be a certain receptivity of consciousness to contain what is going to be given. Otherwise, the energy will just flow completely out of the, the energy field of this world and it will go somewhere else, and then the moment will be lost. Is that enough for the moment? So, in journeying, intention is very important. So, trying to just think of a um, intention for all of us to focus on together. The heart of the world. The heart of the world. We can journey to the heart of the world. Um, <laughs> is that okay? Sure. Why not? And we can journey to the heart of the world, and as we do that, embody our light. Okay. okay. Beautiful. So um, those of you who know how to already work with, with the drum, you're, you know what to do. For those of you who have never heard the drum, you can just let the drum carry you. The, the drum is seen to help um, the shaman alter his or her state of consciousness so that what we call the free soul can be freed from the, the container and the limitations of the ego and the physical body and can journey into the invisible realms. So those of you who have never done any journeying before, you want to set an intention to allow the, the drum to take you, just take you into the heart of the world and just see what happens. Sometimes 
In shamanism, less information is better. Um, we don't, we, we let people have their own experience. So I'll drum for a few minutes, and when it's time to come back, because coming back is very important, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so my drum beat will sound like this. It's time to come back. I'm going to change the drum beat. That's just kind of letting you know it's time to end. Okay. And then, with intention, during the very rapid beating, retrace your steps, come back into this room, embodying your light. So, we're setting our intention as a group, as a collective, to journey into the heart of the world to embody our light as we do that, which creates healing and beauty for all of life, and to come back um, as an embodiment of light. Okay, does that sound clear for people? Okay. So, close your eyes. You don't want to get too comfortable so you fall asleep. There is a difference between dreaming and journeying. Okay, <laughs> so, so keep your intention clear.
So feel your connection with the heart of the world and with the source of light. Know that you are the heart of the world and that you are a body of light. And with gratitude and thanks, just open up your eyes when you feel ready. So as we um, end this afternoon, we close our eyes. And first, we start with giving thanks to the ancestors that have held us in love. The ancestors who have loved this earth and who have passed on spiritual practices and suffered in their own ways so that we might have life and we might be able to experience this beauty and this joy of living here on this earth. We give thanks to the ancestors of the land and we say we too will carry on your traditions in whatever way that we can so that harmony, peace, love, and light return to the planet again. And we give thanks to the spirit of the land here for holding us in love and creating this space that we may join our hearts and our light together with the understanding that there is no difference between any of us. We are light. We are love. We give thanks to the spirits who have joined us today, and we let them know that our work in this room only is done for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.